my name is Harry Durso, and I'm a board member of the Robert Frost Foundation. And I'd like to thank everyone for coming tonight to our 14th annual end of high school poetry night presented by the Robert Frost Foundation of Lawrence. This poetry night was created as part of our Hoot series that presents the original poetry of Merrimack Valley poets throughout the year. I want to thank Erin Niles and Rachel DeGloria, uh, two English teachers at the end of high school for their help in this presentation tonight. I want to thank our, found, our, um, our founder, Mark Shore, myself and Don Michaud, our original sponsor, wanted a forum for young people to speak their truth without any prejudgment. We do not pick the poems and this is not a contest, but an opportunity for the students to address the world. Tonight, we have invited the students and teachers of End of High School and our alumni to share their poetry with us. I was a teacher in various capacities at End of High School for over 30 years. We thank our past sponsors, Don Michaud and his company, Auto Care, and Joe Spanos Productions, and Joe's wife, Bethany, for their support over a 10 year period. We also would like to thank Danny Castino, uh, a graduate of Merrimack College, for her graphic creations for the Robert Frost Foundation. Also, I'm joined hosting tonight by Kate Hernandez, also a graduate of Andover High School, who is, all, who is also a board member. Um, one of the key things that we've started is, it's not the number of poets, it's giving a forum to any one poet. So tonight, we have a group that we're on an honor for showing up and, and giving us their uh, take on on society. And I welcome them, and I welcome uh, former teacher Leslie Ganley and former student Kate Hernandez and myself. And now uh, I usually start by with a poem, and uh, this is from my first book. Of everybody should mute. Everybody should mute. Oh, thank you for the reminder. Yes. Everybody should mute. Okay, this is a, I'm gonna start with a poem called The Better Day. I used to be a teacher once and it was okay. And then one day a boy came to me with a dream, with dreams so bright that they lit a thousand stars and I gave him hope. And then he smiled and I had a better day. I used to be a teacher once and it was okay. And then one day a girl came to me with a heart so empty that her eyes cried dusty tears. And I made her laugh and then she smiled and I had a better day. I used to be a teacher once and it was okay. And then one day a boy turned priest was dressed in gold that shined through his first blessing. And I gave thanks and then God smiled and I had a better day. I used to be a teacher once and it was okay. And then one day I was asked a thousand questions from a thousand days, but I answered all but one. And then I smiled and I had a better day. That's my old to end of high school. Okay, Kate, it's all yours. I'd like the board members to read too, if they can. Sure, sure. All right, well, I wanna make sure the students get showcased uh, first yeah, and absolutely. foremost. Yeah, absolutely, they're, they're first on our list. Yeah, so, um, so, Abinia, I, I'm sorry, I just messed up your name. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Or or Connor, which one of you, whichever one of you would like to, you know, you're unmuted, so you get to go first. <laughs> All right. I was just gonna say, I I can start. Um, I'm Abinaya Ganesh. I'm a senior at Andover High School. Um, I have two poems. This one I haven't gotten to share with anyone or really like anywhere yet. Um, I saw on social media this statue in Italy called the Juliet of Verona. And there's a tradition that for good luck, you, um, in the same way you like put your hand on like the foot of a statue, but this one is you put your hand on her chest. Um, and this inspired me to write this. In the city of Verona, there lies a statue named Juliet. She stands there as a symbol of love, her love for Romeo, the love that ended in death. She stands posed in bronze, Men travel from all over the world to gaze upon her beauty, to polish her chest with their hands for their good luck and fortune. Her face is unchanged. No one softly strokes her cheek and whispers in her ear, you are real, you are human, you have value. 
but her chest glistens with gilded with the knowledge that men want her and that was all Juliet needed. That's Juliet from Verona, or Juliet of Verona. Um, and I have one more uh, that I could read now as well. Um, this one uh, was published in last year's spring issue of Ink Magazine, um, where we did fairy tales and ghost stories. This one is called Campfire. Flick, crackle, crackle, crackle. And they were never seen again. We take a moment and scream, unison cacophony of juvenile fear. There's something so intimate about it, sitting around a campfire. The collective feeling of your hand st hair standing up, the smoke swirls around and becomes the monster of your choice. Our fears were so simple, claws and sharp teeth and beady eyes that pierced through the uncertain of a world far greater than we could ever know. It's my turn for a story. I will concoct a tale of terror and together we will scream again as one. That is Campfire. Um, Connor, if you would like to share. Yes, um, sorry, I apologize for there might be a lot of construction. Um, I'm at work right now and we're just like doing operations. Um, so this one is uh, called Champagne. Uh, basically in our junior year, it's sort of a rite of passage to read The Great Gatsby. Um, and one of, I'm sure you're familiar, one of the uh, largest plot lines is this um, sort of tension between, uh, you know, The Great Gatsby um, and like the other characters and just love throughout. Um, and so this is sort of an ode to that tension um, between several different love triangles uh, and relationships. So champagne. Champagne for the pauper and caviar for the kings, inlaid root of deep sage pine, a fit to nice tin strings, bands of thousands, braids of gold, fountains of wine and wealth, it's all for you, I know it's true. Men never are ones with stealth. But men are also other things, as are the deeds they sow. A thousand faces may launch one ship, but how far will that ship go? Don't answer, please, although you will, I know the answer's end. It starts with me and ends with her. A daffodil smile, and then. Ah, the chimpy. Um, And then... I sort of wanted to highlight some of the other poems um, by either graduated members or people that contributed to our previous issues. Uh, we published last year a dual issue, um, and it actually had two covers. I have, there's a fairy tale sock, and then on the flip side, there is the, uh, it was called the ghost story side. Um, and so they highlighted different works from a variety of authors. And so I'll read now Last Floor by a current senior, Anthony Salazar. Second floor, boredom, as I reminisced, I had nothing to do. So I patiently waited till I reached floor two. I scrounged my way through each door until she came through, an angelic voice. Anthony, como estas? Grandma, she walked through. It was hard to see her. Light followed her. She was never one to wear hats, but upon her head, light shined like a halo. The halo settled on top of her head like the latest fashion trend. I never understood how. I was delirious. She had this gift to uplift my mood, even if I was furious. She was Mother Nature. And whenever she would hold my hand, my cloudy eyes would start to precipitate. She stayed in here, holding my hand like a precious family heirloom. She stayed, last floor. As she stayed, the L button lit, the doors cranked open, no one came through. It was a place, an empty place, but it wasn't dark. Happiness sprouted here as Carla Furla's spring, landing on the sweet tulips in Norway. This is where life has taken me. This is where my journey begins. I was expecting someone to come in after this stop, but this was my stop. I took one last glance at her. She brought me all the way here. Once again, my condensed eyes start to precipitate. Go out there, Tony. And so there I was. 
That was last floor by Anthony Salazar. And then Abane, did you want to share another poem? Um, I can if you give me Connor, why don't you talk a little bit just about Ink Magazine and I will pull yes. up the document because it is not working for some reason right now. All right. Um so Ink Magazine, uh I'm sure you're all familiar with it, um, continues to print uh our issues highlighting the art and poetry of different uh, Andover High members. Um, lately, we've been getting a lot more into the artwork, uh, featuring several uh, photographs, compositions, um, and paintings. I have some of those photographs uh, here tonight, um, as well as some of my own personal work uh, that will be included in the upcoming issue. Um, it's a slideshow, so I don't know if I think I can present my screen. Hold on a second. I'm going to see if I can um, make the, well, actually, you know what? Yeah, let me see. Okay. I just changed the setting, so you should be able to do it now. Um, are you able to see uh, the current screen? Yeah, we can see it, Connor. All right. So, uh, Magazine always tries to connect nature um, with sort of the antitheses of nature. Uh, we had our issue of surrounding spring and growth, um, as well as our issue surrounding ghost stories. Uh, this issue will likely take the place as a sort of uh, an ode to color and just the diversity of color and all that surrounds us. And so through my work, I wanted to sort of highlight the transition from how we notice color and nature around us to how we get into the darker, more concrete human man-made uh, aspects of nature around us. Um, so this is a flowering tree. Uh, this was in, I think it was Cascais in Portugal. Um, what I wanted to just sort of bring light to the situation was just the contrast between the pattern mosaics, um, which are typical in Portuguese culture and heritage, um, as well as the flowering tree. This was in the Royal Gardens. Um, and it was striking to me how simple the decorations and the flora and fauna were um, within the gardens itself. Uh, the, you know, the purpose in such a very like abstract, very overstimulating environment, the royal palaces. Um, it was very refreshing to get these sort of views of simplicity and nature. Uh, and so I wanted to bring sort of attention to that simplicity uh, by highlighting uh, this work. And then as we get into the man-made objects, um, we have on the right, just a spiraling staircase and on the left, uh, a cityscape of Prague at dusk. Uh, these operate not really in any special function, um, just to sort of play with light and color and composition uh, and sort of make, you know, there are gradients in each. There are attentions to the simple things, the simple lights. Um, and I just wanted to sort of figure out how light can change our perception of an environment. Prague is often seen as a very grim city. It's very cold, it's very harsh in the winter time. And so it was very nice to see such a pleasant ombre of blue uh, sort of surrounding the amber color lights. Here we have, uh, this is also, this is just a simple oak tree. Um, and this was basically just sort of getting into how we perceive 
um, the contrast between nature uh, in a very black and white setting. Um, you can see the light is sort of spilling out from the tree's darkness, uh, and then that is gently transitioning to a much darker uh, sky in, in the top of the photo. Um, all I wanted to do here was sort of play with this contrasting composition. Uh, the top half is very plain compared to the bottom half, which is full of the luscious trees. Um, and sort of elicit this almost web-like, spider-like uh, scene. Uh, in my time in Portugal, um, color and sort of the liveliness of nature was all around you. Um, but I wanted to notice what would happen if you took away all of these very bright and bold colors. Uh, on the left, you can see what the typical street would look like, highlight, literally highlighted in yellows and blues, all along a very azure sky. Um, but when you remove color from the equation, the reality becomes a lot darker and grimmer. Uh, the photo on the right is what the typical uh, back alleyway or yard would look like. And it is especially contrasted with what we imagine uh, the serenity of Portugal to be. Uh, the harshness of architecture and how we sort of deal with that harshness, um, literally in this case with renovations, uh, was also an important aspect of my photography. Um, I took several uh, sort of facade scapes um, of this building and also, I don't know if you're familiar with the Hurley building uh, in downtown Boston. It's currently the Department of Mental Health's headquarters. It's this like very old IMP style uh, uh, garish brutalist building. Um, and I just wanted to bring attention to the facade and sort of the that kind of between what we think of as beautiful architecture and the reality, which is much, much darker. Um, I'm going to stop now to give Abandaya the stage to read two of her poems. Uh, so I believe I can, I'll just stop sharing my screen. Hi, yes. So these two poems are actually not by me. Um, they are by two current Andover High School uh, juniors um Kai Cruz and Eva Liss who are both currently in rehearsal for our high school's drama guild um drama fest production right now so they unfortunately could not be here but I will be reading Kai Cruz's first this is called Love Letter to the World Dear world when I wake up in the morning you are dark silent but when I rise so does your sun and I feel the warmth of its glow on my skin I feel beautiful shining under the sun's gaze Dear world, when I walk outside in the bitter cold of winter, it makes me feel my cheeks, the way my skin flushes a deep pink, makes me feel the blood flow under my frozen skin and shiver. I see there is beauty even in the extremes. Dear world, nature bored me, but I no longer ignore it. Dew on the grass in the morning, rabbits scampering to and fro, squirrels hustling up trees, the intricacy of ice and frost enveloping life in the winter, the leaves metamorphosis in autumn, changing color and finally falling to their inevitable deaths. The glow of summer, the bloom of spring, change is beautiful to me. Dear world, I try to notice the little things, the knowing glances of friends, gestures and inside jokes only they would understand. The tone of someone who speaks about something so passionately they could go on for and on forever. The hugs, kisses, touches, unconditional love, humanity. All of this is beautiful to me. Dear world, there are things, days where everything hurts, like a knife under my skin trying to rip me apart. Sometimes the pain is almost too much for me to bear. On those painful days, the days I wish I wasn't here suffering through it all, you remind me that I'm not alone. And no matter how cliche it may sound, it's the truth. There is beauty even in the toughest times. Dear world, I thank you for this life. I don't say it as often as I should, but writing this poem reminded me that we should all be a little more grateful for small things, big things, everything. There's beauty in everything. The world has given us. We just have to look beyond the surface, even if it's hard. Who knows? It might even save your life. It saved mine. So that was um, Love Letters to the World um, by Kai Cruz.
And then really quickly, I have um, Virtue Ethics by Eva Lith. Good is another word for happy, and that may seem simple enough. What if I said happy was trying to be another word for truth? And I will not know until the end, not for a long time. Then isn't that the hope? I will not know if my life was another meaning of living and if the living should turn out to be joy. But I think when I have the time to think, a chorus of voice, laughter, lightning in the air, warm smiles in a crowded room and your hands in mine is a life I think will be worth living. The end can wait impossibly long for an answer that may not come. I have my own. Thank you so much for sharing that. It was great to, to include people who couldn't be here. So appreciate that very, very much. All right, wonderful. I have um, the uh, advisors, the teachers from Andover High. Any, do you have something to share with the with the rest of the class? <laughs> well, I'm retired now. <laughs> but last, last year- From poetry? I, my, last, my last year of teaching, I got to teach all year with um, with Rachel, which was an incredible privilege. And I'm just realizing how much I miss her. This is terrible. But anyway, <laughs> I'm not a poet. I, I appreciate- Come back, it. Mrs. Ganley, just come back. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not a poet in either. Class, in your classroom, I will. <laughs> I'm not a poet either, so I'll leave. I I leave that to the kids. <laughs> yeah, it's so inspiring, though. I it, this is a beautiful, beautiful gathering, and the works you just shared are wonderful. The poetry is is so moving, and the photographs are so moving. I wanted to say, Connor, I love your um the shadows in your photographs are really interesting. I wanted to ask you so many questions about that. Um, nice job. It's really well, thank great. You. It's really great. Both of you. That's awesome. It's awesome. Well, I, well, I, have a, I have a poem I was oh. going to share, maybe, because Harry inspired me. He's like, well, if you want to read anything, and he knows I'm not a poet, but every year this gets me inspired to go looking, looking. And um, so I look on my daughter's bookshelf who graduated back in 2014. Um, and she attended the Sewanee Young Writers Conference one summer, like the summer after her junior year, which was a really cool experience. So I found on her shelf um, this book by Wyatt Prunty, who is, um, he was the founding director of the Sewanee Writers Conference, not just the Young Writers Conference. And I started reading them and I thought, these are wonderful. So. I appreciate Harry and other people, um, you know, inspiring me to get to, to looking at poetry. So I will read you one of these poems because I just think it's cool. And I think he published this in 2009. And this particular one is called Time's Train because I have been thinking a lot about time lately since I turned 65 and retired and life is becoming very different, you know, um, and going to Rachel's wedding last year and talking about beginnings, but time's train. So in this tale, he gets to come back after seven dumb years, six feet under. He is invisible, of course, alone, about the town, aloof yet full of wonder at what remains and what's no longer. Meanwhile, he's just the same and we are he, traveling in the ego split hunger of having it two ways at once set free to pity and self-pity, allowed time to grieve for time and the long slide by which subtraction makes a place for us in line. This is the perfect setup where the switch occurs not in his coming back, but in our infant longing that the world not change when what we mean is us. And now he's in like so much damp and finds his house arranged the same as always pathos here because he fits and doesn't. So grief's a minor art now practiced room to room as though a clause was what time was without a start, more fold than tear. So no one going anywhere, only seeming to. Rails parallel, time's train. On the porch, his wife swings, brushing her hair and everything he's thought, he thinks again. So I do commend to you, Wyatt Prunty. These are beautiful poems and I know he's done a lot, so.
Thank you so much for sharing that. That was lovely. Mm -hmm. That's great. <laughs> Um, I've could got a I couple of phones around me. They're all chiming at the same time. So I've, I apologies. Okay. Could I ask a question? Absolutely, Karen. Oh, thank you. Connor, your photographs are just beautiful. They remind me of Stiglitz in New York City with his, his photos and even a little bit of an, of a urban Ansel Adams with this, with these shadows. It's just, they're really good. Do you, this is going to sound so strange. This is mm -hmm. going to sound strange, but do you like jazz by any chance? Uh, I don't, I don't mind oh, okay. it. Okay, um, okay. Yeah, I'm not a, I'm not a, what would, like, um, I am not what a, a jazz fan would call a jazz fan, but okay. I, I do, I do. You should listen to more of it. You might be surprised. You may like it. And it, it, jazz and urban settings just seem to go for me they go along with each other thank you keep it up thank you i agree i like to photograph like urban settings um especially while listening to music yeah yeah thank you great well in the interest of it being uh an andover high uh themed night and i'm the alum I was not there while we were doing these hoots because I left school more than 14 years ago. <laughs> so, um, but uh, I did look around. I, I also had, don't have my own original. Um, but today I was looking for humor, um, just looking for something that was lighthearted and fun, um, but also poignant. So um, I went looking through Ogden Nash's co uh, collection um, and came away with the tale of Custard the Dragon. So Belinda Belinda lived in a little white house with a little black kitten and a little gray mouse and a little yellow dog and a little red wagon and a really -o -tru trulio little pet dragon. Now the name of the little black kitten was Ink and the little gray mouse, she called him Blink. And the little yellow dog was sharp as mustard but the dragon was a coward and she called him Custard. Custard the dragon had big sharp teeth and spikes on top of him and scales underneath, mouth like a fireplace, chimney for a nose, and really oh, truly oh, daggers on his toes. Belinda was as brave as a barrel full of bears and ink and blink chased lions down the stairs. Mustard was as brave as a tiger in a rage, but Custard cried, for a nice safe cage. Belinda tickled him, she tickled him unmerciful. Ink, Blink, and Mustard, they rudely called him Percival. And they all sat laughing in the little red wagon at the Rilio, Trulio, cowardly dragon. Belinda giggled till she shook the house and Blink and said, weak, which is giggling for a mouse. Ink and Mustard rudely asked his age while Custard cried for a nice safe cage. Suddenly, suddenly they heard a nasty sound and Mustard growled and they all looked around. Meowt, cried Ink and ooh, cried Belinda for there was a pirate climbing in the window. Pistol in his hand, left hand, pistol in his right and he held in his teeth a cutlass bright. His beard was black, one leg was wood. It was clear that the pirate meant no good. Belinda paled and she cried, help, help. But Mustard fled with a terrified yelp. Ink trickled down to the bottom of the household and little mouse blink strategically mousehold. But up jumped Custard snorting like an engine, clashed his tail like irons in a dungeon. With a clatter and a clank and a jangling squirm, he went at the pirate like a robin at a worm. The pirate gaped at Belinda's dragon and gulped some grog from his pocket flagon. He fired two bullets, but they didn't hit, and Custard gobbled him every bit. Belinda embraced him. Mustard licked him. No one mourned for his pirate victim. Ink and blink in glee did gyrate around the dragon that ate the pirate. But presently up spoke little dog Mustard, 
I'd been twice as brave if I hadn't been flustered. And up spoke Ink and up spoke Blink. We'd have been three times as brave, we think. And Custard said, I quite agree that everybody is braver than me. Belinda still lives in her little white house with her little black kitten and her little gray mouse and her little yellow dog and her little red wagon and her really-o truly -o little pet dragon. Belinda is as brave as a barrel full of bears and Ink and Blink chase lions down the stairs. Mustard is as brave as a tiger in a rage, but Custard keeps crying for a nice safe cage. <laughs> I hope that was as entertaining for all of you. So, <laughs> and then I, I saw something earlier today and I thought, oh, that's perfect. Um, you know, it's not, not a full poem, but <clears throat> excuse me, just say a Charles Dickens quote, uh, it being the, is it the, the 12th of March, what's, what's today's date? Um, so it was one of those March days when the sun shines hot and the wind blows cold, when it is summer in the light and winter in the shade. It just feels like today was that kind of day. <laughs> I took the dog out for a walk wearing a coat and mittens because it was cold. And I got home and I was sweating. <laughs> so if the wind's not blowing. It was warm. Um, Harry, do you have anything else? You being the, uh, the, the, the um, caboose on the Andover train here? Or do you want to yeah. wait until after the board members and close it out for the evening? I think uh, I would like to ask the two students to do one more each if they could can they up are they up to it or did they go um i think and i have, might have signed off yeah um, and i know connor you're at step. work so do, connor are you able i know you're at work are you able to do one more or do you need to get back to work no yeah i can um i can share one uh this one i think to date is our only poem to ever been submitted anonymously um to this day we still don't know who who gave it to us, um, but it was one of my, my favorites. Uh, so this was from our, our third edition uh, last year, Wonder uh, was the theme. So this is to see or not to see. Seeing is believing, right? We trust our eyes to take us to the truth, leading us on towards our futures, one lens at a time, but we were gifted by other senses for a reason. Close your eyes, dear reader, and listen for a moment. You cannot hear the stunning russet tones of a dying sunset, nor the bright reflective shine of winter ice. But you can hear birds singing outside, wind blowing, electricity humming, trees creaking. We sing to show emotion where words fail. Craft tune and melody from the patterns of raindrops and insects. Look down now at your hands, maybe dry from the cold with nails bitten down or shined up. Your hands can't touch someone's tone of voice or the creaking sounds of a house asleep at night, but you can brush your fingers over the feathers of a friendly pigeon. Hold a rough skin toned gently in your cupped palms. Feel the smoothness of air from the window of a car as it tugs and shoves your hand back and forth, or the smoothness of water at a pond or the ocean. We weave satin and burlap in tandem, make things rugged and regal and things in between. Your nose might be clogged this time of year or dripping from some type of cold. It struggles to define the shape and size of what's around you, but it remembers the smell of dirt after rain, of flowers blooming in the spring, and maybe their pollen too. The heavy smell of smoke rising from a fire or the smell of a cold winter's day, biting and brisk as it tries to pull your warmth away. Fresh baked be bread and homemade food, the smell of being home. Feel your mouth, too, teeth and tongue, the least recognized sense in life, too visceral to be sanitized by poetry. But your mouth is important like the rest. You might remember the taste of your favorite food or something you ate of more recently. The feeling, the warm feeling of coffee, tea, or hot chocolate, and the refreshing cold of ice or water. The strange chill of mint, the frantic burning of spice, your mouth does little to help sense the world around you but it's one of the senses that makes us the most human. We taste mostly what we love and forget what we dislike. Even if the bad taste lingers for a while, it only feels what we dream and deem worthy enough. To put into our mouths, it holds a large part of our identity that way. Just a reminder to look around in more ways than one, dear reader. Try to hear what you cannot see or feel. 
to touch those things that defy your other senses. Maybe there are more layers to life than you think. So that was To See or Not to See by Anonymous. I love how you forget what you dislike. That's a gift. It's a real gift. Wonderful. All right. Um, Karen, Rich, or uh, yeah. Helena, do you, do you have any um, anything you'd like to share? Anything you brought in today, originals or, or covers? I have one if anybody wants to hear it. And I just want to say one thing before we um, start wrapping up. You know, the reason we do this every year, and hopefully we will continue, is because I've always felt, and Mark Shore and Don, and everybody in the board has felt that the genius is uh, in the students of, of who represent our future. And tonight we saw our future in front of us. And I want to stand, Connor, and I can't pronounce, okay, help me with the other name. Abenea. Abenea. And you too, Rachel. I want to thank you for showcasing brilliance tonight. Not just ordinary talent, brilliance. I'm in awe of what I saw tonight. And thank you. Please thank Erin and everybody in the Baha'i for a beautiful night and share our joy with them tomorrow, okay? These students were awesome. Just awesome. I'd like to end tonight with a poem. I know that um, uh, I can't overcome my feelings of joy tonight, but I want to just end with another poem so we have a complete night of poetry. I want to thank the board for coming tonight. I want to thank Rachel and Erin for presenting us with the greatest students, and I want to thank them for sharing the other students' work. To me, that was one of the greatest things I've ever seen. Congratulations for doing that. That was a great sign of maturity and uh, intellectual greatness. Thank you. And I'd like to end this poem about a job I had in college. It's called Daffy's. A lifetime ago, my father was in a private hospital, clinging to life with one daily prayer. I worked through college then with three jobs. One job was driving very wealthy little children to a special needs school far in the countryside. For four hours a day, I listened to the wisdom of severely special needs angels. I taught them as well, and we were together for years, so we were an unusual family. One boy was autistic and treated every car ride like a trip to outer space, thrilled to be in my spaceship. My biggest lesson came unexpectedly, one spring day that tells us that our winter is over. He began to hit me, not unusual from someone in the autism prism. He began signaling me to pull over, and I did. He wanted to get out of the car. I took his hand, and he took me out to a grassy field. He screamed in joy. Daffy's, 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 with happy tears flowing from his eyes. I asked him, why Daffy's? And he said, play with dog. I got it. Winter was over, and he could play out with his dog outside. A message from the heart of a nonverbal boy that I hold in my heart every day. The best words ever heard in my life were play with dog. I say it to myself as I negotiate old age, like an explorer with a faulty compass and a torn sail. I repeat his words when depression overtakes me on certain days, like the steam from a boiling tea kettle. I say play with dog over and over. The boy would be 60 now, and I hope he's playing with his dog, even if he's in heaven. A nonverbal autistic boy was more profound than Shakespeare or Plato. Play with dog says everything about sheer joy in this life. I hope I feel that happy as he was that day even if it only comes a few times in my life, it'll be worth it for all of us to play with dog. That's it. <laughs> Katie there? Yep, thank, you. Muted, so. thank, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. I can't say enough, Kate, for your job tonight uh, and for everyone you. who came tonight. I gotta go. Helena? Yep, she had to go. Oh, okay. Uh, I want to thank everybody tonight for coming and Kate for running the show and um, uh, Rachel and Erin for uh, getting the 
brilliant students and the two students, thank you for giving us a beautiful uh, uh, reading and sites and, and photos that we can share with the world. It's gonna be on TV in 10 stations and on YouTube. So you'll be famous pretty soon, okay? <laughs> Thank you so much. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. The Robert Frost Foundation. Thank everybody for coming. And we'll do it again, hopefully next year. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.